Excellent. All right. All right. Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Evanston 2023 Municipal Election Candidate Interview Sessions. My name is Tom Moser. I am a board member with the Democratic Party of Evanston. And today, along with our president, Rachel Rettenberg, I will be, we will be speaking with Kathy Hayes, who is running to be Alderperson of the Ninth Ward. I want to thank you all for watching this video and remind you all that our upcoming Democratic Party of Evanston endorsement session will begin on the 19th of February. Uh, I'd like to remind you that voting members uh, or members of the uh, organization will be able to vote on whether or not we endorse candidates. So I invite all of you seeing this to come and join us. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to begin uh, by asking Kathy to tell us a little bit about herself. Kathy, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with the Democratic Party of Evanston. And I hope that uh, I will be able to provide some insights on who I am and why I am running. Uh, my name is Kathy Hayes. I have been born and raised here in Evanston. Uh, my family goes back approximately four generations. I was raised in the fifth ward, uh, which is the historical uh, black uh, ward of Evanston. And we moved all around and through Evanston. I'm a grandmother of three very tall children um, who I love dearly like most people do. Yes, I am the shortest one in the family, and I uh, am running for the ninth ward seat to, to be alderman of the ninth ward and to represent all of the residents and neighbors of the ninth ward. All right. Well, thank you, Kathy, again, and uh, we'll jump right into it. Uh, I think we'll begin broadly and then narrow it down a little bit. Let's start with... Uh, how well do you feel the city of Evanston has upheld its goal of assessing decisions and policies through the lens of equity? Well, equity, first of all, is a journey. It is not just a stopping point or a takeoff point. It is something that you continuously work on. Unfortunately, we've had many issues uh, regarding equity that the African-American workers have brought to the forefront with their proposed document stating that there has been systemic issues uh, with employment and how they have been treated for not only this year, but for decades. In our community, the, meaning the African-American community, we knew of some of these issues, but this particular group of individuals was courageous enough to step forward and say, not only say, but document, these are the issues and this is why this is a problem. This comes on the heels of having another scandal regarding the lifeguard and the beach issue. Um, I understand that the city is trying to address all of these issues. They are never easy to address. However, it is the responsibility of a city to make sure that their system is based on merit. And, and work and goals versus uh, bias and, and innuendo. So at this point in time, though I appreciate that they are working on it, this is long overdue and has been for quite some time, not just this administration, but many administrations. And it's going to take some very difficult uh, conversations, some hard work, and some real honest soul searching on everyone's part about how this system should be run. It may be that we need to look outside of the system to help to find best practices to run an, uh, a system that is balanced for everyone, including the African-American employees, including the young ladies that work at the beach. So it's an ongoing process and we need to review it annually regularly, constantly to see where we're at as a city. Speaking uh, to the letter that you referenced, they included an action plan for the city. Uh, yes, they did. In there, uh, are there items that you agree with? And if so, can you talk about some of the specifics that you'd like to see implemented? And are there areas with which you have disagreement? Um, 
I do appreciate the suggestions that they made as to how to address these issues of equity. Uh, I think that they were very well thought through. Um, many of them I do agree with. Um, I would also say that some of the some of the things that are just basic common sense type of of suggestions um, is what we should have been doing all along. And I believe many of the people thought we were doing all along. But to have a balance on uh, a merit scale in which people are being reviewed on how their work is going or a balance scale on how people are being um, addressed when they go to have a write-up and so forth is very important. If, if one person gets just a write-up for an incident that is pretty identical to another person's issue where they get a suspension, that's a major problem. And there needs to be an independent type of review board that can say annually or continuously, we, you need to tighten this up. This is where we need to educate more. This is where we need to train more. And this is where we need to investigate more. Um, many of these complaints that were given or were outlined were also given to the system and they were kind of swept away. That is a problem. There needs to be a an accounting and recording system for these incidents on an ongoing basis and a checkup to see how it was resolved. That needs to be known. Um, there are some systems that require that not only you, do you document this, but that document is then followed up with, whether it is three months, six months to a year, to make sure that this is not continuously going on and that there isn't um, retaliation that the employee is is receiving because of the report, which is the main thing, or you will not have people reporting. They won't have faith in the system. So this is more than just uh, their suggestions. It's about restoring faith in a system where they have their livelihood and not being in fear. Okay. Uh, several years ago, Evanston became the first city in the nation to pass reparations. The program has recently come under some criticism for the slow pace of the payouts. How do you feel that this program can be improved? Let me be clear. Um, given the cultural history that I come from, reparations is, is important. It should be done. I believe in the work that they are doing. Um, I believe that it, the study that will go through Congress, that will be put together with Congress, will address some issues nationally. I believe in reparations. I think that it's important. Many people in my community have been harmed. I mean, the data that the Shorefront organization, Dino Robinson and many others were able to extrapolate literally says that we were told you cannot come out of this section because you are in essence less than we will not have a risk with you so that cut out for many people up under the cut out cut us out up under our legs the multi-generational wealth that many people talk about the fact that we were not able to access issues of liberty because of one one major issue, and that is the color of our skin, is wrong. That was an emotional harm, an institutional harm, and it permeated through many generations. We could not move anywhere. We couldn't go anywhere. So yes, I support reparations. I understand that there that people have some issues with uh, the program, but this is the first program in all of the United States. There's going to be bumps in the road. What we need to do is work together to make sure that the program continues to be a success. Of course, it had a slow start. No, there was no uh, plan or grid that you could use in that would be. It was brand new. It was like speaking French on a on a desert island. So you had to use the tools that you had to try to make this work. My goal is to make 
this work because many of people in my community have helped build this community since the 1800s. Not just my family, but many other families. And my history, cultural history, is linked to America's cultural history. It's one and the same, 365. So it's very important that we have equity in the fact and, and equality in the fact of these things. But more important, we need to repair the damage and the harm that has done so it does no longer affect more generations of children. I want my grandchildren to be able to do the same things and have the same opportunities as other grandchildren throughout this country. The same competition, uh, the same work, the same housing and family development that I need them to be able to have true economic development, true economic wealth, true generational wealth, which encompass all of that. But I definitely don't need them to feel less than because people did not want to take a chance for us moving and living and getting loans and 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 we were being uh, um, accused and abused because of the color of our skin. That's wrong, no matter who you are or where you are. So this is a start, a courageous start, a hard working, difficult start, but a start nevertheless. In what you've just said, you referenced housing on a number of occasions, and I'd like to turn in that direction because it is, like you said, very important. And despite the number of new residential units conducted in Evanston over the last few years, especially in high-rise developments approved by the city council, housing costs in Evanston have continued to rise. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that the inclusionary housing ordinance is doing enough to combat this? And what solutions would you like to see implemented? Well, I have to first preference by saying housing costs are rising all over the country, uh, all over Chicago. You see every night issues in different communities where they've been hit very hard. So unfortunately, with this international pandemic, it started a ripple effect that we are still trying to um, uh, rebound from and the housing costs have go up. We have delivery issues. All of this is, has made the, from the international pandemic has made just quality of life very challenging. And though we might be at the height of the pandemic, we still have residual issues such as housing that continue to affect and, and deflate our, our needs on a daily basis. Um, are they doing, is the ordinance doing what it's supposed to do? It is. However, there's a lot more things that we need to be doing. Um, people need to be able to live in mixed housing or have housing that has wraparound services for them to segue into um, the neighborhood living that Evanston has been noted for for many, many years. Um, many people just cannot afford it and they are afraid, and they are under pressure, and, and they are worried, where are they going to live? Housing is one of the major issues that gives you not only liberty, but security. It is very difficult to have control of your life if you don't have control of your housing. I am extremely, as a landlord, I am extremely empathetic to the costs that hit the landlords as well. So both ends need to have some type of support. And we as a, a government entity, we as an, a, a community need to look to see what creative ideas can be put together to help not only support tenants and owners, but also landlords and businesses. Businesses are catching it too. They are, they're barely getting people to come back in. People still have some um, anticipation about going out in public. We now hear there are other health challenges that are going on, not only here, but internationally as well. And we have got to figure out a way to stop um, them, to stop the fear and help people come back into the fold. People are running up and down the street like they used to. Sometimes downtown looks deserted completely. 
as well as the other mom and pop stores on different sides of our communities. But those type of institutions help feed and house families here in Evanston and elsewhere. Um, unfortunately, uh, it has come to the press recently that rents are going up almost uh, 200% for the things that are happening in our communities. And it is difficult to live here. We have to come up with the plan that helps not only these big companies that are coming throughout the country and buying up these multi-unit buildings, but a plan that will keep our neighborhoods intact. And the only way you can do that is to have neighbors that can live there. Even though it is not in your ward, uh, mm -hmm. there have been contentious discussions around the use of the Margarita Inn as a residence for unhoused individuals. Yeah. Evansonians of all stripes, we all have our opinions about what happens in our town. Uh, yeah. What do you feel could be done to assuage the concerns of local residents while still providing services to our city's most vulnerable population? You know, that um, is a very important part of who we are as a community. Um, the fact that we were able historically to invite new people in and care about them and support them. We've lost that um, for the past, for a while. I am extremely empathetic to the residents of the Margarita Inn and, and to many of the plight of the homeless. I have worked in social services for, mm, 24 years, uh, working with the county, working, uh, and then 10 years outside of the county. So as a direct services council person, um, counselor as an and trained person, I understand that there is a multitude of issues that individuals face uh, in going, you don't wake up one morning and say, hi, I'm going, I've decided to be homeless. It's usually a cascading effect of or result of effects that have happened to you uh, over time. We definitely need our social service agencies. Uh, we definitely need our mental health professionals that can help individuals get the therapy that they need, get the medication if necessary that they need and help them as, as case managers, help them put together a plan to get back into a productive role, not only for themselves, before the rest of the community. Um, I think having a very open plan of how that happens is essential so that the residents are informed, the businesses are informed, as well as the, the tenants are informed as to what the expectation is for you getting back and being reintegrated into the community. Um, we also are going to have issues regarding ex-offenders coming back to the community. We have to um, figure out an ideal plan for re-entry for those who are less than and those who are dis disenfranchised. Um, I am not sure how the city, I have been to some meetings where the city has articulated different things regarding the Margarita Inn, but it doesn't seem that it has swayed the nervousness of the communities around the Margarita Inn. Um, and unfortunately, incidents do happen and it heightens people's awareness because it's made it to the press. But if we stay our due diligence and creating systems that believe in re-entry, not only just here at the Margarita Inn, but other areas, um, we would probably have a better time of explaining it. There is a shortage of, of therapists throughout the country. Uh, we need to work with our institutions that train people, that uh, are in the process of getting people on that front line of therapy to help them address individuals who need treatment, what, what, regardless of the type of treatment it is. It may be drug-related treatment. It may be mental health treatment. It may be victimized treatment. We need to have a plan that addresses specifically those things. And 
we have many social service agencies here in the area and plan for some more, but we need to have a understanding, a clear understanding, because a lot of people are confused. Do I call 311? Do I call 911? Do I call 883? We need to educate everyone on a consistent basis. And I think consistency is the biggest thing on a consistent basis of who to call, where to call, and what the expectation is when you do call. Thank you for that. Um, returning back to the subject of housing, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, recently signed into law by President Biden includes grants for helping low-income citizens get environmental upgrades to housing. This includes some vital infrastructure improvements like lead pipe abatements and environmental upgrades like solar panel insulation. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, not many people know that these are available to them. What can the city do to help citizens access these benefits? Um, and if I can ad lib a little, uh, as a landlord, uh, what can we do to help landlords take advantage of some of the uh, tax exemptions that'll exist for uh, upgrades and so forth? I know that um, this sounds like a, a repeat of what I've said earlier, but education is everything. Landlords feel like they're under attack. Um, you can't get the upgrades unless you own the building, if, unless you own the home uh, in many cases. So uh, our staff at the city needs to put together a plan to reach, and, and we have the da data to reach those who own the building and say, why don't you come and, and check out what we can offer? Being available, answering the phone, um, literally putting together an, a, a packets of information and explaining those packets of information, whether it's a flyer or notice, and, and having it articulated through every community, north, south, east, and west, that the, this is what's available. And this is how you can get to this bonus or, or grant. And this is how you can, and literally hand walk them through. By the time people come home, get off the train, uh, pick up the kids, they aren't searching online on how they can get all these benefits. There are many benefits out there, but as the institution of government, it's our job to make sure that the public not only knows about it, but understands it and have, and sometimes most you will have to hand walk them through. Yes, it is tiring. Yes, it is a lot of work, but you can't just hand them a pamphlet and say, why don't you try this? It'll, you might be able to get some money. This is not the, this is something that families need to, to have so that they can be in accordance with sustainability, so that their bills can go down, so that their water is still quality, so that their, their health is okay. One less thing, but you're going to have to walk them through how to do that. They are not experts on grants and how they work or how to facilitate them. But a young lady was doing my hair the other day and she goes, I don't know how to get my assessment, my taxes down because they said we didn't fill out home homeowner's exemption. And I was like, so I, I called a couple of places, but I didn't know or and they didn't return my call. Well, that's unacceptable. Um, she did not live in Evanston, let me say that. She was from a different suburb or lived in a different suburb, but I was able to explain to her, this is who you need to call. They have hours between A and B. And, and no, you don't have to call a realtor or a lawyer or a professor. You can literally call, the, they have people that are employed to do exactly that, to walk you through their systems. So education is everything, um, being open with people every time you have uh, an event or fair or um, literally a, a newsletter, you need to put that in there. And if they have any other questions, you need to be able to be the resource for them to say, okay, well, I got your email, I got your email or I got your newsletter. And it says that I can call ABC about you know, how I can get solar paneling. 
Yes, you can. Let me give you the name and number of Sally or John or whomever that will walk you through that system and, and that there is a continuum, that they aren't just dropped off and that you go back and check to say, well, did you reach them? Did they call you back? Are, um, are you in the process or did you decide to do something else? That is the type of nurturing that is necessary in public service. It always has been, it always will be. And if you don't do that, you're going to get dissension, argument, and negativity. Thank you for, so much for that answer. Um, you know, public service is very much in line with the next question that we'll be asking. And it's, you know, overall, the do you feel that the expenditures by the city of Evanston um, over the last four years have appropriately ref reflected the priorities, needs, and interests of Evanston residents? Well, the short answer is no. <laughs> but the longer answer, and I'm sorry for the longer answer, is because the city of Evanston elected officials are in the process of articulating what those values are. Um, so in, in truth, them articulating amongst themselves and getting reform, because for the most part, this is a new council. And for them to uh, sit down and work out what the values are um, is very important. They also have sessions, and, and they're, I'm sure they're reflecting those values as their residents have told them some of their issues. I know when I go canvassing, people have been very willing to articulate what their issues and values are regarding the city. It is a difficult task. Um, it is not easy. However, it is the job. So the bills and the budgets are kind of difficult to understand, even for those who are policy wonks that understand budgets and process and policies. Um, making it simple, making it plain to layman terms has been quite difficult. And the reality is we all have our own home budget, family budget or whatever. So it shouldn't be that difficult to find out information, number one. And number two, it shouldn't be that difficult to track the information. So it is my hope that the city and, and its administrators will make it plain, to make it clear, make it concise, so that folks understand what their tax dollars are doing, can do, and cannot do. Because you can't do everything, but you can't, you are doing something. And the people really are confused about what are they doing? Narrowing in on the budget and uh, people's relationship to it, the Evanston City Council has allocated $3 million of the American Rescue Plan Act funds to be dispersed through a participatory budgeting process. Yeah. How do you feel the process has gone so far and what can the city do to get more people involved in this process? Um, first of all, I commend them of bringing this up because I think it is a positive way to get community input and involvement and that it just does, ideas just don't go away. Um, I, this has been, it started in Brazil. I have been to several sessions that uh, PB has put on. Um, enjoyed the energy that is there and the ideas and the idea collection, the ideas that are being brought forward. And some of them are quite creative, insightful, and educational. Um, every neighborhood is a little bit different. And I think that this is a good possibility for those to not only be heard, but to also take investment and action in the community. That's why I enjoy so much. I'm very much in favor of PB. Um, Chicago has done it for some decades now, and it has been, they do theirs differently, this is true, but has been um, very uh, thought of in a positive term. Um, and I hope that the, it will continue. Again, this is another ingenious pilot project for Evanston, even though it's been done in other areas and other countries. This is a new one for Evanston. So they're finding their way. 
um, and I believe that they're going to start narrowing down the scope of thousands of ideas that they have collected over the past few months uh, to start putting them together uh, with budget delegates to to put together a process and a form in order to work on projects and narrow it down. So I am a fan. I am a fan of people, of, of items that include people um, at, to speak for themselves, to have their own voice, um, to articulate their own craft and art as far as uh, great ideas, great solutions. This is a, a, a program that is definitely solution-based. So I think that this is a positive thing. And I think that this is something that the Evanston uh, government got right. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, <laughs> earlier in our discussion, you spoke to the fact that, you know, our streets and our small businesses are not what they were before the pandemic. And I'd like to dig a little bit deeper in what you believe can be done to promote development in a way that prioritizes small businesses and local ownership. And I know we have discussed this obliquely uh, a little bit before. Mm -hmm. You know, small business is the backbone of this country, period. Um, it hires people, it trains people, it inspires people. It is part of the lexicon of the great American dream. Um, and and Small businesses truly are a backbone. Uh, big businesses and developers, they, they grow from small businesses. Someone who had an idea and a thought and made that dream go into a bigger scope, probably beyond the dreams they even thought of. I think that we need to quit treating big business, especially here in Evanston, as an afterthought. I think that's where we need to start. If we can build up our, our small businesses uh, help them and support them um, instead of having adversarial conversations with them. It might be um, more productive for all of us all around because all of our kids in the summer need jobs at these small businesses. There's so many lessons that they learn from working. All of the, and all businesses will be the ones that hire them. Um, seniors, as well as those who are trying to make a way and a living. There are many people who are literally raising their families with the help of small business. And we need to support that effort. Um, we also need to be good and fair to our their employees, absolutely. Uh, but the employees need to know, or the businesses need to know that they're not fighting on both ends. They're not fighting us, they're not fighting the customers, they're not fighting they need some type of refuge and we need them in the community. If we do not have small businesses and unfortunately so many businesses in downtown Evanston and the surrounding area have had to close. They've had to close from, because they believe that they're being um, focused in on unfairly, that they're being attacked all the time. We can't get blood out of a turnip. We need to be able to educate them or they need to be able to come to us as a government entity and educate us on where we can help them. And then we need to be able to articulate reasonable accountability issues with them or they'll close their shops and leave and we'll have nothing. There will be no tax base that we can tap into. Uh, so I think fairness um, on all ends, but more importantly, understanding and a co civil conversation of support is what's needed with our small business as we climb back to the, the vitality that we had prior to. I was talking to someone the other day and said, when I was a kid, we had the Custard Street Fair in the summer and they block off the street. And I mean, people were buying up stuff left and right. Folks were up and down Custer. Um, and, and there was a concert, a little neighborhood concert, but it was neighbors and neighborhood. Those are things that help integrate and network the neighborhood together. Beautification of our downtown. I understand when the, the businesses say downtown needs to be cleaned up. I get it, but so do all the other side businesses as well. Um, the streets need to be fixed. 
we had to push back as a government entity some of the um, capital improvements that were going to happen because of COVID, not only for one year, but for two years. So hopefully we'll break ground and they'll be patient, you know, as the city works to, to upgrade our streets and our transportation. But it's, it's going to be a long haul. So we have to have con, uh, understanding conversations and not just shout matches. That's not going to work. I don't think it ever does. <laughs> uh, as we draw to a close, I'd like to uh, touch on a subject that affects uh, all of Evanston. Uh, Northwestern is a big part oh, yeah. of our whole community. How would you make sure that the city's relationship with the university adds value to the lives of your constituents? Mm. Well, you know, we have different opportunities. Northwestern does do a, a good neighbor type of uh, contract relationship. And I believe this every five years, and I believe this is the end of the fifth year, or we're going into the fifth year. Northwestern is a major draw. We are married. Evanston and Northwestern is married. And how that marriage relationship cultivates is very important. And just as the same things that make a marriage successful at home will make a marriage successful with Northwestern. We need to have clear um, and balanced communications with them as they go forth and build their stadium, because they're going to build their stadium. We need to be able to articulate to them some of our expectations. And they need to be able to tell us which ones are realistic and which ones are not. But the devil is in the details. And we need to be able for Northwestern with all of their creativity, all of those great brains over there with students and everything else to sit down with us and say, you know, we would like for you to feature our neighborhoods. We would like for you to feature our small businesses. We would like for you to feature our contract workers, whether they're minority businesses or women businesses, not just for a moment, but for maintenance, uh, we would like for you to contribute to security, parking, and so many of the things that will come with this new stadium. The stadium is going to come. I get it. I just want to make sure that our residents, our businesses, our contractors have an even playing field to work with Northwestern in making this stadium the beautiful uh, panoramic view that they have drawn out. For, for their foundation. Kathy, uh, that brings us to the end of our questions. I would like to thank you so much for joining us this evening and giving us your time, and I'm sure the voters will appreciate it as well. Uh, I would again like to remind everyone uh, that the Demo Part Democratic Party of Evanston's uh, endorsement session voting will begin on the 19th of February, and so we invite you all to become members of the Democratic Party of Evanston, so you can vote in our endorsement session. Again, I'd like to thank everyone involved and say good night.